move in that direction. Now, Acts chapter 2 is where we've asked you to turn, and this morning I want to continue uh, the message or the series that we began a couple weeks called The Other Baptism. Would you say that with me? The Other Baptism. In our first week of our messages, we introduce the idea that the Scripture clearly teaches another baptism other than water baptism. And we identified in that first message that this baptism is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, in that first week, we gave you references, Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.8, Luke 3.16, John 1.33, Acts 1.5, all four Gospels, the first five books of the Bible reveal this truth. John baptized with water unto salvation and repentance, but Jesus will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we see these two baptism and this other baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now that was week one. And then last week we talked about the other baptism before and after. Say before and after. What we looked at last week is that we showed you the spiritual transformation that took place in Peter and the disciples' lives before Acts 2 and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and after Acts 2 and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can and wants to transform our lives even today. Now, if you missed either one of the first two messages, please go back to the YouTube channel or locate that through the website Listen to those messages, get the whole part of this series. As we continue this morning, my focus today is the other baptism, wind and fire. Last week was before and after, today is wind and fire. And in the Bible, there are seven, at least seven symbols of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are symbols? Symbols are images or everyday images or word pictures for us that help us understand something that we don't easily understand. And how many know you mentioned the Holy Spirit, and for some that's hard to identify, what does that mean? How does the Holy Spirit work? Who is the Holy Spirit? And so the Bible gives us symbols. Now there are seven of them. How many know there's the symbol of the dove? At the the water baptism of Jesus, the dove descended from heaven. A dove speaks of gentleness and peacefulness of the Holy Spirit. The, The Spirit talks, uh, the scripture talks about the Holy Spirit as oil, and oil is, is used in the lanterns that lights the path, and also oil was used to anoint kings and priests in their life. So a dove, there was uh, oil. Water is another symbol of the Holy Spirit, and it's used in the picture of rain and river. We all know what rain and river, and the idea of the Holy Spirit falling like rain and flowing like a river. Not only is there the dove and the oil and water, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by wine. Wine um, is, represents uh, the, the idea of covenant, and it also speaks about the intoxicating work of wine and how the Holy Spirit can work and over and, and control and intoxicate our life with the Spirit and not just with earthly things. And then there is the seal. Seal. Not a, not a seal, you know, the animal seal that plays in the water. Uh, the seal like the security seal, like the presidential seal you see on the podium or at the White House. Or if you, or a, how many have ever heard of the good housekeeping seal of approval? That's the seal where it seals it and says, this is authentic and this is secure. And so these five um, symbols, the dove, the oil, the water, the wine, and the seal. Now there are two other symbols that we're talking about today and we're going to focus on the two symbols, wind and fire, because these were the two symbols that were visible on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's read Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind. Everybody say wind. And the Bible says, and it filled the house where they were sitting. There appeared on them cloven or individual tongues or flames like as fire and each of them and all of them were filled or baptized and we told you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be full and to overflow with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues or in different languages as the Spirit 
gave them utterance. Now notice, on the day of Pentecost, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was symbolized for us as wind and fire. Notice there wasn't a mighty rushing wind, but there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And there wasn't real fire, but there were cloven or individual flames of fire. And it looked like while this wind or this, this sound was going through like wind, there was this, it looked like little, um, little flames of fire resting on each of their heads, which symbolizes the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those are the two symbols we're going to focus on today. Here, here's today's big idea. The other baptism is a baptism of sanctification and restoration. Everybody say sanctification. And everybody say restoration. That's what the other baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's about. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit to bring sanctification to our life and restoration to our life. Wind is about restoration. Fire is about sanctification. Charles Spurgeon, who was known as the Prince of Preachers, said this amazing quote, Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind and coals without the fire. We are useless. So today as we look at wind and fire, let me give you two principles. Number one, let's talk about fire as the Holy Spirit. The fire is the symbol of the Holy Spirit that speaks of the sanctification work of the Holy Spirit. Say that word again, sanctification. Now it's a big long word, it's a theological word or term which speaks of the Holy Spirit working in our life to purify, to make holy, and to cause us to continue to be pure in the Lord. Now, that idea of sanctification is very important because it's a work of the Holy Spirit that's symbolized by fire. It means to set apart, to set apart holy. Now, I, I, when I was growing up, my mother had a china cabinet. Anybody, everybody had, anybody know what I'm talking about, a china cabinet? She had, in the dining room, we had this beautiful china cabinet that was glass, and in there were beautiful china cups, or there were crystals, crystal things. And in that cabinet, how many know that was no touchy? Kids could look. It even had a light inside the cabinet to, to show the beauty and, and to put them on display. But you didn't touch them. Matter of fact, they were sealed off. They were closed off. They didn't get dirty. They didn't get messy. They weren't going to break, right? Well, that's the picture of sanctification. Setting us apart. Just like my mother set apart her china and said, this is the china. We don't use this every day. We, this is not something that we touch or break or get dirty. This is something that displays the beauty. And how many know that's what God wants to do? He wants to set us apart even in a world that's crazy and wicked and ugly and dirty and, and all kinds of craziness, how many know God wants to set us apart by the Holy Spirit so that we look beautiful in the midst of an ugly world? So that we look holy in the midst of an unholy world? So that we look good in the midst of a bad situation? You see, God wants to work His work in us by the Holy Spirit to sanctify so we're set apart. Not that we're better, but that we're different. And that we can reflect the beauty of Jesus in a world that needs Jesus. That's what it means. You see, fire in the Bible, or, or, or fire in the Bible, uh, uh, talks about the Holy Spirit in different ways. He can pilot us. Anybody remember the story in Exodus 13 when they were traveling uh, through the journey through the wilderness? They had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night fire, the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, that's one way. It's a, Then also the Holy Spirit protects. In Zechariah 2.5, God spoke about putting a wall of fire around his people to protect them. And then also the Holy Spirit with fire is symbolized with passion. Passion, that is Leviticus 6 talks about a God igniting a fire on the altar that would never go out. And Jeremiah talked about the word of God and the spirit of God in him like a burning fire. Passion. But the Holy Spirit, while He pilots us and while He protects us and He brings passion to our life, the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to purify our life, 
to sanctify our life, to set our life apart. What does that mean? There are three things that that means. The Holy Spirit has the power, has the power to make us holy. The power to enable us to live righteous and the power to help us stay pure. Now that's a mouthful and I want to break it down just for a couple of moments. The Holy Spirit, this sanctification work means this. The Holy Spirit can make us holy initially. How many know we were sinners, but now we are saints, not because we are perfect, but because God has forgiven us or washed us by the Holy Spirit. He makes us holy. He gives us the position of being holy. But how many know just because you have the position of being holy, how many know we have to then live righteous every day? In other words, a doctor gets a degree and it says you are now a doctor, but now he has to go out and practice being a doctor. We are declared righteous or sanctified or purified at salvation in the sense that God has made us holy, given us the position. Now we then have to continue to live righteous and act that way. How many know you can't do that on our own? How many know it's hard to be holy every day? How many admit there are temptations in this world and and there's evil around us and there are bad things and, and there are influences and every day it's hard to live holy and the only way we can do that is with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need that fire to work in our life. And then to help us stay pure. I know it's one thing to be initially holy at salvation positionally, and then to try to practice every day to live righteous, we need the Holy Spirit. But how many know to stay holy? To stay holy. Even if you don't go out and do something wrong, how many know at the end of the day you're sweaty and dirty and tired and you almost feel like you need a shower, don't you? Well, the same thing's true spiritually. Think about it. The stuff that we go to work, we go through life, and we hear this nonsense, and we see this, and I mean, that gets on us. That gets in us. And we need, at the, I tell you, at the end of the day, I just say, Holy Spirit, just wash all that junk off me. That stuff that I had to listen to today, the stuff I had to deal with today, the, the, the things that got in me today that I didn't expect or want, wash that out of me. Burn that out of me with the fire of, of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the sanctification work of the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you a few scriptures to support that. Um, Matthew, Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and 3 is an Old Testament prophecy of this work of the Holy Spirit. He says, behold my messenger will come and prepare the way of the Lord. That was John the Baptist. Then it goes on to say, then the Lord would also come who is a messenger of the covenant, speaking of Jesus, his first and second coming. At both Jesus' first and second coming, he will come as a refiner's fire. A refiner's fire like fuller's soap, that's laundry soap, better than Tide, gets all the wrinkles out, gets all the spots out, gets all the dirt out. How many know God, by the Holy Spirit, is a refiner's fire that washes and burns out? Um, And it says, he will refine and purify the silver and purify the Levites, the priests, who we are New Testament priests, and purge and sanctify them to offer up offerings of righteousness to the Lord. How many know pure metal can only be made pure by fire? And the way we become pure gold and pure metal as in God and able to be what God wants us to be is by the fire and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3 and Luke 3, which we talked about when John said, I baptize you with water and Jesus baptized you with water, they add the phrase, and with fire. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit fire. And then verse 12 in Matthew 3 and verse 17 in Luke goes on to say, who's fan? Now when you see that word fan, it's not talking about one of those boxes that circulates air. It's talking about a shovel that actually has little holes in it. And the shovel, they would, they would take the wheat that was harvested and they would take the shovel into the wheat and throw it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff off of it and the wheat seeds would stay in the shovel and fall through the holes and go onto the threshing floor. You see, the throwing it up into the wind would blow the chaff away and it would separate the wheat from the chaff. How many know that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do? Separate the good from the bad in our life. Separate the godly and the ungodly. Help us to discern right and wrong and live the way he wants us to live. And then it tells us in Titus 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done. How many know we can't be holy on our own? We can't live righteous every day by ourselves. 
We can't stay pure if we don't ask God to help us. We'll fall into the same traps and fall back into the same patterns. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to help us and to purify us. And to work. He says, not by works of righteousness we've done, but he saved us how? By the washing of regeneration, that is the cleansing and forgiving of the blood of Jesus at new birth, and not just the blood of Jesus that forgives us initially, but the renewing or the ongoing sanctification of the Holy Spirit that he shed abroad through Christ. Now what's interesting is I looked up that word renewing of the Holy Spirit in Titus 3.5. And it speaks of the, the root word means to renovate or renovation. Sanctification is like a renovation. Anybody ever renovate a room of your house or a part of your home? Come on, let me see. Wave your hand. Okay. How many know we've been going through renovation here at, 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 at the church for the last couple of years? And thank God for what has been done. But how many remember we, we were, our, our student area has been on hold for about three months because they couldn't get the supplies and the workers were so busy? Well, finally they started working on it. And by the way, that's why that area is closed off today. Uh, but it will be back in operation Tuesday, which should be finished. The flooring and everything should be done. But how many know renovation is, is where, you, where you take something Thing that's not what it should be and make it what it ought to be and what you want it to be. And that's the idea of the Holy Spirit renewing and sanctifying work. Now, how many know what the three rules of renovation are? There are also the three rules of sanctification. It costs more than you expect. Come on, how many ever renovated something? It costs more than you expect. It's messier than you expect. And it takes longer than you expect. How many can testify those are the real rules of renovation? Well, that's the same rules of sanctification. How many know it costs something to let God purify us? You know what it's going to cost us? It's going to cost us saying, not my will, your will. Not my desires. How many know it's going to cost us saying, Lord, I used to go to that place, now I don't go there anymore. I used to say those things, I don't say them anymore. I used to hang with those kind of people and people who did things that weren't pleasing God, and now I don't hang there, and I do hang with those. Who, you see, there, that's, that's the cost. There's a cost to sanctification. How I many know some people don't want that cost? They just want to be saved and go to heaven, and they leave out the in-between part. Well, the in-between part is the important part, where the Holy Spirit works and makes us into the image of Jesus. You see, salvation is about giving our life to Jesus. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit making us like Jesus. And that cost. But I'll tell you what, there's great beauty and there's great blessing and there's great power in that. Now, not only does it cost, how many know it's messier than you expect? How many wish we weren't so special and God would stop messing with us a little bit? God works on this and he works on that and he starts and he starts convicting us of this or not condemning but convicting us and challenging us to change this and challenging us to grow in this and and boy some how I many of growing is painful and 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 sometimes it's messy but it's worth it you know the renovation it's messy but but when it's finished oh boy and then it takes longer how I many know you didn't go from sinner to saint in three services. I mean, we didn't go from the old person to becoming all of a sudden super Christian, come on, in one day or one year or two, ten years. Come on, how many know it takes time? How many admit God's still working on us? How many admit God's still renovating? I know He's renovating this guy and He's working. And if we will, here's the thing don't get discouraged. Don't get, how many know? Let Him keep renovating, let Him keep working. And you know what? It's going to be a beautiful picture of Jesus. And you know what? The world is looking for the manifestation of the children of God. That's what the world needs. It needs to see people who will shine when it's dark. People who will be good when there's bad. People who will show light when there's darkness. People who will be hopeful when there's despair. That's what the world needs. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do through the sanctifying work. For 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 says, We give thanks to God because He has chosen us for salvation through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect or chosen ones according to salvation of God the Father through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. So we looked at fire as a symbol of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at wind. Secondly, wind is the other symbol 
of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about today. And that speaks to us of the restoration work of the Holy Spirit. Say restoration. So we have sanctification and we have restoration. Now, wind in the Bible in Scripture is the Greek word pneuma, which means breeze or breath. Breeze, like a cool summer breeze, Breath like when you breathe in the cold and you see the breath in the, in the cold wind. See, the Holy Spirit as wind speaks to us of three things. I'm going to take you through the three things that the wind represents um, by the symbol of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit has the power to create new life out of nothing. The Holy Spirit has the power to take something that is nothing and make it something. Aren't you glad that when we're facing something and there is nothing good, nothing right, nothing looks like it's going to change, guess what? The Holy Spirit has the ability to create new life out of nothing. Let me show you in Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, go all the way back to the beginning. It says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? He tells us in verse 2. The earth was without form. It was nothingness. It was just empty wilderness. It was void, empty, no life, nothing on it, nothing green, nothing growing, no, no life. And the Bible says there was darkness. And the Bible says with that nothingness, the Holy Spirit moved over the face of the earth and created life out of nothing. That word moved, the Holy Spirit moved over the void and the emptiness and the darkness, is the word brooded or hovered over. That speaks of like a young mother bird who sits on the eggs, hovers over the eggs to keep them warm and protected until their birth. That's the picture of what the Holy Spirit did in creating life out of nothingness in the beginning. What a beautiful picture. And you know what? When we feel empty, and we feel void, and we feel like we're in darkness, and we feel like that, that, that there's nothing there, how many know if we will ask the Holy Spirit, He can come with one wind, one breeze, one breath, and He can take nothing and create new life. In it. Job said this in Job 33 4. The Spirit of God made us, made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Wow. The second thing that the Holy Spirit can do, symbolized by the wind, is that the Holy Spirit has the power to breathe full life into something. He can create new life out of nothing, but how many know the Holy Spirit can breathe full life into something? He can take nothingness and make it into something, but when there's something that needs fuller life or better life, the Holy Spirit can do that. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, this is when God created man. And the Bible says, and the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. That is, he took man and he shaped an image and he shaped the the outline of a man and he put a skeleton and he put skin on it and there was the form and the shape of a man. But the Bible says that wasn't the end of the creation. The Bible says that God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life and he became a living soul. You see, the skeleton and the skin and the shape is nothing without the breath and the life. And God took something, a shape and a skeleton and skin, and he breathed life into it. And he took that something and he made it full of life. Think about this a moment. The physical life you and I have right now, the breath, everybody take do inhale and exhale. Do you realize in us is the very breath of God? That's just not any breath. That's just not any wind. That's the very life of God. And think about if we're born again by the Spirit, we not only have physical life and breath of God in us, we also have spiritual life and breath in us today. Listen, no breath, 
no life. He breathed into man's nostrils. In John 20 and verse 22, remember the disciples after Jesus died, they panicked and they went in fear and they hid in the upper room and they hid there and they isolated themselves and they were emotionally and mentally and spiritually drained and upset and Jesus walked through the door. And he comes into them. And the Bible says this in verse 22. Jesus breathed on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed life. They were empty emotionally. They were empty spiritually. They were empty uh, mentally. They were exhausted. And he breathed life into them again. Receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Third way that the wind is symbolized by the work of the Holy Spirit. Not only can he create new life out of nothing, not only can he breathe full life into something, how many know the Holy Spirit has the power to restore fresh life into everything? How many know just sometimes you just need something fresh? I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people when I go to the grocery store, I reach in the back for the milk with the better date. Anybody with me? Are you like that? Oh boy, I'm not going where you shop. Because you're going to take all the fresh ones. I don't want the one that's going to go out of code in a couple of days. Right? How many know everyone's, we all want something fresh. And you know what? Every day we should want fresh new life. Every day we should ask the Holy Spirit, would you breathe into me today? Not only am I going to breathe physically, but would you breathe spiritually into my life today? And give me a fresh breath. How many know sometimes you just need that, remember on a hot day, and you get that cool breeze, it just restores you and just makes you feel, wow, that's a, just a fresh breath. It just makes you feel invigorated. That's the idea of the Holy Spirit restoring fresh life into everything. Ezekiel 37 is an amazing prophecy of this principle here. Ezekiel is taken by the Spirit to a valley of dry bones, dead bones and dry bones. And God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, only you know, God. How many know that's a great answer? You got to love Ezekiel. That was pretty smart, wasn't it? God asks you a question, you don't know the answer. Oh, you know, God. Of course, you know. And then God says to him, prophesy to these bones. If you want these bones to live, prophesy to them. In other words, speak truth to them. Let them hear the word of God. And so Ezekiel speaks the word of God to the bones. And the Bible says that when he spoke, there was a noise. The bones begin to, then they begin to shake. There was a noise, the bones, and then he began to shake. And then there was a coming together, the hand and the arm and the shoulder and the skeleton and the bone just begin to come into place and they came together. But here's what happened. There was a noise, there was a shaking, the coming together, there was the shape and the frame of the skeleton. It even says that the sinews and the muscles came on the bones and the skin came on the thing. But then it said, but there was no breath. There was no breath. No breath, no life. You could still have a shape. Well, I, I say I'm a Christian. I hold my Bible like a Christian. I use Christian words. I read the Bible every once in a while, I say a prayer occasionally, but if there's no breath, oh boy. I mean, no, there can be a lot of noise, and a lot of shaking, and a lot of coming together, but if there's no breath. And then he says to him, prophesy or speak truth or ask the wind to come. You feel like life is just a bunch of noise and all this shaking that's going on and all this. And you need breath, you need fresh touch, you need God to, to breathe new life into us. Ask the wind. He said, ask the wind to blow. And so he asked the wind to come from the north, south, east, and west. And the Bible says when the wind came, those bones that had come together and shaped, now all of a sudden begin to live. And these bones stood up as an exceeding great army. I mean, you know, that's a picture prophetically of Israel then 
and the church today. God wants to breathe his breath into us so that the church raises up as a mighty army in these last days. That it will not be defeated. Yes, there will be battles. Yes, it will be difficult. But we can be victorious if we have the breath and life of God and the spirit power in our life. You know what? How many will admit that in our world today, there's a lot of noise? A lot of texting and tweeting and teaching and, and all, this, all this stuff, noise. But no breath, no spirit, no life. How I many we got a lot of shaken? Anything that can be shaken today is being shaken. And there's a lot of drama, isn't there? There's a lot of emotion. <laughs> Come on. There's a lot of shaken. Everybody's shaking their fist at this one and shaking their fist at that one. And, and they're posting with a shaking their fist at this one about then. They're shaking back at them. That's why I'm not on those social media things, because they're gonna, they're, somebody's going to shake at you, you're going to shake back at them. And there's a lot of shaking going on, but there's no life. There's a lot of coming together, isn't there? We've got gatherings, we have church services, we have prayer meetings, we have activities, we have Bible studies, we have life groups. But listen, if there's no breath, oh, come on. If there's no breath, there's no life. If there's no breath, there's no spirit. If there's no breath, there's no power. If there's no breath, there's no transformation. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the noise. I'm tired of just shaking. I'm tired of the... Com- you know what I want to see? I want to see breath. I want to see life. I want to see power. I want to see... Trans- you know what I want for this church is I want these bones to live. You know what I want for your life is for your bones to live. What I want for the church around, not just this church, but the church around the world to be revived and to live and to raise up as an exceeding great army. Can these bones live? God, you know. But how many know he wants us to ask the wind today if you need life and breath and strength and power and transfer? Ask the wind to breathe and to fill our life. Here, here, here's the bottom. I got to wrap it up. Here's the bottom line. Here's the question I want to ask in closing today. We've looked at fire and the wind, two symbols of the Holy Spirit. Has life knocked the wind out of us or extinguished the fire in us? I mean, you can't live long enough and hard enough without at some point having the the life knock the wind out of us. Come on, you get a bad report medically from the doctor. You get a pink slip at work. You face a death of a loved one or a family member. Come on. You're dealing with financial disappointment or, or difficulty. How many know life has a way of just knocking the life and the breath out of us? And sometimes life can also extinguish a fire. Once we were passionate about life, hopeful in life, strong and vibrant and ready to take on the world and on fire for Jesus and flowing and operating in the gifts and serving and doing all this. And life came along and just through a wet blanket and just tried to, and threw dirt on top and extinguished the fire. Now listen, I don't care who you are, all of us have that happen to us. You can't help it. Life, and you could fill in the person, the circumstance, the situation that caused that. But you know what? Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is a fire that can ignite a new fire in you today. The Holy Spirit is a wind that can breathe new life into us today and fill us. And you know what? That's what God wants to do for you. That, those of you that are watching online in the building, that's what God wants to do for us. He wants to ignite a fire and He wants to breathe new life into us today. I close. Stan, I'm going to close with this. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 17 to 20. 
Here's what's going on in the story. Jesus had just healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. Now, how many know that got the religious Pharisees all up in arms? And so they called a meeting. Oh, don't you love it how they called a meeting to destroy Jesus and to arrest him? You know what? Jesus knew about the plot to arrest him. And you know what? He let them bother. You know, can I say something? Somebody wants to, let, let them bother. You stay focused on the Lord and the good things. And he focused on the mission and he turns to the multitude and he says this, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Now he's referring to Isaiah 42. If you want to write that reference down next to Matthew uh, 12, verse 17 to 20, because that was the prophecy, Isaiah 42 and here, Matthew 12, Jesus is speaking the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah 42, now here in Matthew 12. So he says that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, that my chosen one, my servant, in whom I will send, speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, and he will come and he will bring the gospel to the Gentiles and to the world. And when he comes, it says this, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. Now I want you to think about this. He said, I'll put my spirit on him, and a bruised reed he won't break, and a smoldering wick he won't snuff out. Now these two images, a bruised reed and a smoldering wick, parallel the two symbols we talked about today, the wind and the fire. Let me explain. Anybody know what a bruised reed, anybody know what a reed is? Anybody grow up near water or by a marshy kind of lake or river? Or you see those long, tall plants that grow up, that long stem that are near the water. And what happens? You see them blowing in the wind. They're real tall. They're reeds. That's, that's what a reed is. It's this long, tall that blows in the wind. How many know if the wind is really strong, it will bend it, but it won't break it? I'll con and weeds are flexible. Reeds are flexible. They're, they're affected by the wind, but they don't break. They bend, but don't break. So what's the prophetic promise to us who feel like we're a reed? Blown in the wind. We feel like life is blowing us all over the place, blowing us back and forth. Up. You know what he says? I won't break you. The wind of the Spirit. Listen. The work of the Holy Spirit is not to destroy our life, it's to restore our life. A bruised reed, he won't break the wind. Now, a smoldering wick, he won't snuff out. What's that speaking about? How many know in the Old Te or New Testament days, they used lanterns, and there was oil, and they took a flax cloth, which was just basically cloth, and they would saturate it in the oil, and they would light the cloth in the lantern. How many have ever seen an old-fashioned lantern that was with oil lamp? When they lit the wick. And what happens when the wind comes with a fire? How many have ever seen a lantern? What happens when you light a match and the wind comes? It flickers and it goes out, right? What's the prophetic picture of Jesus and the Holy Spirit? He says, a bruised reed who's blowing in the wind won't break. And a smoldering wick that's flickering in the wind won't get snuffed out. Listen, some of us feel like we're flickering. Oh, come on. Some of us feel like we're bend, being bent and bent and bent, but we, God won't break us if we'll ask the wind to help. And listen, some of us feel like we're flickering, flickering, and we feel like we're going to go out and we're going to burn out and we're going we're gonna to lose it and we're going to lose control and we're going to go crazy and we're gonna, it's going to all end. It's going to be, listen, you may be flickering, but he won't snuff you out. Can I ask you, are you a bruised reed? Don't raise your hand. Don't say it out loud. Are you feel like a bruised reed or a smoldering wick today? Come on. There are times when I've felt like a bruised reed. feel like I get beat up. Sometimes I feel like a smoldering wick. I feel like everything's trying to blow out my, my take, take away my joy and take away all the other. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is here today. And listen, he can breathe new life in you. 
and he can ignite a fire in us. Come on, close your eyes, lift a hand toward heaven.